Israel holds a unique place in the world due to its rich historical, religious, and cultural significance. However, in a bid to revive a seemingly lost custom and reclaim ancient values, some developments have taken place which have sent shockwaves to the religious community. What are these events? And what do they mean for the future of Christianity? Join us as we delve in the recent happening in Israel that changes everything. In the Middle East's heart, specifically on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea, Israel boasts a geographical and strategic significance that belies its modest size. Its unique position at the crossroads of Asia, Africa, and Europe has shaped its history and continues to influence its present and future. Lebanon borders the country to the north and shares a border with Syria to the northeast. To its east, it is bordered by Jordan, and to the southwest, Egypt. The country covers over 8,500 square miles and is home to 9 million citizens of different blends of cultures, with the Jews being the majority and the Arabs being the largest minority. The most significant history of the Jews in Israel is a long and complex narrative that spans thousands of years. Their origins can be traced to the patriarch Abraham, who is said to have settled in Canaan, the ancient name for the region. The land of Israel played a central role in forming the Jewish identity. It was divided into two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south, with Jerusalem as its capital. These kingdoms had a succession of kings, including King David and King Solomon. In 586 BCE, the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem, destroyed the first temple, and exiled many Jews to Babylon in the Babylonian exile period. After the Babylonian exile, the second temple was built in Jerusalem as a religious and cultural institution for Jews. During this period, there were multiple revolts against foreign rulers, and in 70 CE, the Romans destroyed the second temple during the first Jewish-Roman war, resulting in widespread Jewish dispersion. Following the destruction of the second temple, Jews were scattered across the Roman Empire until the late 19th and early 20th centuries, when the Zionist movement emerged advocating for establishing a Jewish homeland in Palestine. After World War I, the League of Nations granted Britain a mandate to govern Palestine, causing a significant increase in Jewish immigration to the region. Not long after, on May 14, 1948, a declaration establishing the State of Israel was read and published. This declaration came shortly before the end of the British mandate and was followed by a war with neighboring Arab states, the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. Some of the conflicts endured by Israel with its Arab neighbors are the Six-Day War in 1967 and the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Israel has since signed peace agreements with Egypt in 1979 and Jordan in 1994 and has negotiated peace with the Palestinian Authority. Israel is making significant efforts to become more modern, yet its biblical history makes it established as a historical land with significance in different religions. Let's discuss the significance of Israel to each of its major religions. Israel holds profound significance to Christians due to its central role in the biblical narrative and the life of Jesus Christ. It is often called the Holy Land because it is the setting for many significant events in the Bible. Bethlehem, a city in the West Bank, is traditionally believed to be the birthplace of Jesus Christ. Bethlehem's Church of the Nativity is a significant pilgrimage site for Christians worldwide. The Gospels in the New Testament of the Christian Bible describe the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, much of which took place in the region that is now Israel. Important locations and critical events like the Last Supper, Crucifixion, and Resurrection are believed to have occurred in Israel. For centuries, Christians worldwide have undertaken pilgrimages to the Holy Land to walk in the footsteps of Jesus and deepen their faith. For Muslims, Israel holds a complex and multifaceted significance rooted in its connection to their history, religious sites, and cultural identity. Jerusalem, known as Al-Quds, remains a focal point of spiritual importance, symbolizing unity and shared heritage among Muslims worldwide. The Dome of the Rock, an iconic gold-domed shrine in the old city of Jerusalem, is believed to mark the spot from which the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven during the night journey. It is a visually striking symbol of Islamic heritage and faith. For the Jews, Israel is their historical homeland, housing the Western Wall, Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, a remnant of the Second Temple, one of Judaism's most sacred sites. Israel is often called the Promised Land 
in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. According to Jewish tradition, God promised the land of Canaan, which became Israel, to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This covenant between God and the Jewish people is central to Jewish identity and faith, reflecting a profoundly ingrained theme in their everyday lives. Establishing the State of Israel in 1948 was the start of fulfilling this aspiration. The Law of Return adds to it by granting Jewish people the right to return to Israel and become citizens, regardless of nationality. Israel, particularly Jerusalem, is a convergence point for Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. It serves as a location for interfaith dialogue and interaction among the Abrahamic faiths. Now just very quick, if it's your first time here on my channel, I would appreciate if you would like the video so that you can help me to continue spreading Christian messages. Subscribe and also click that notification bell so you won't miss any of the next videos that are uploaded every day. All right, let's keep rolling. Fostering conversations about shared religious history and heritage. Although the three religions share their faith's origin, the same issue pervades as a problem. Origin. In the three religions, a particular site is believed to be a holy site, where the Muslim's dome of the rock stands. To Christians and Jews, it is believed that this site is the location of the first temple, Solomon's Temple. It was built as a place of worship for Yahweh, the God of Israel, and the location is known as the Temple Mount. After the destruction of the first temple and the Babylonian exile, the Jews eventually returned to the land of Israel, and King Herod the Great rebuilt the second temple. Known as Herod's Temple, it became the center of Jewish worship until its destruction by the Romans in 70 CE. Years after the destruction of these two temples, plans surfaced about building the third temple as a proper place of worship for the Jews. The rebuilding also marked the beginning of the Messianic Age. Unfortunately, the Dome of the Rock sits atop the Temple Mount, which is the alleged location of the third temple. Muslim scholars had initially denied the existence of a previous temple at the site of the Dome, and it went undebatable and unproven for years before British archaeologist Robert Hamilton discovered that the Al-Aqsa Mosque was built on a Jewish ritual cleansing site. He discovered this after an earthquake shook and destroyed part of the mosque. While investigating the mosque's foundation, he discovered a mikveh, a Jewish ritual bath used for various purification purposes within the Jewish tradition. Usually the mikveh is built before the temple's construction because it is considered very important and must also be connected to a natural water source, continuously replenishing it with fresh water, making it living water. It was a prerequisite for gaining entrance to the Temple Mount. When Robert printed a paper detailing his investigations and findings, it was discovered that these facts were already known but confiscated by the British Mandate archives so as not to upset Islamic officials. Although all three faiths sometimes conflict about their shared roots and the locations of their holy city, there are other hindrances to building the Third Temple. Aside from laying claim to the Temple Mount, one of the hindrances is the effect it would have on residents and business owners in the affected areas. More pressure would also be put on the area's available infrastructure and public utilities. Also, the Temple Mount is located in a delicate area, and any disruption could cause a severe change in biodiversity and may lead to social tension in the community. Now that there is proof of a previous temple, a group of elders called the Sanhedrin are taking steps and finding ways to rebuild the third temple. The Sanhedrin were originally administrators and lawmakers, but the nascent Sanhedrin was put together mainly to cater to the needs of the new temple to be built. They began by cultivating farmlands as they claimed that the plants were just as crucial to the sacrifices performed in the temple as the blood and ashes of the animals used. They also try to recreate Israel's natural environment during biblical times by working with government agencies and environmentalists to grow trees and participate in other land conservation efforts. While several individuals and groups criticized the nascent Sanhedrin and have continuously questioned their authority and jurisdiction, the Sanhedrin has remained consistent and focused on rebuilding the temple, keeping the Jewish law, and readying all that would be needed before and after the temple is rebuilt. One such is the Kohanim. The Kohanim, or a Kohen, is a hereditary class of Jewish priests in Judaism, believed to be descendants of Aaron, the brother of Moses. Kohanim have special religious duties and privileges within Jewish tradition. 
and their lineage is significant in religious rituals and leadership roles. In ancient times, Kohanim played a central role in the religious rituals conducted at the temple in Jerusalem. Of course, the temple no longer stands, but Kohanim are still accorded special status in synagogue services and other religious functions. Kohanim are subject to certain restrictions, including limitations on whom they can marry. This is part of what the Sanhedrin train them on, including the handling of the temple ceremonies and the equipment used on the altars and offering burnt offerings. The burnt offerings usually performed in the temples consist of plants and the blood of some animals. However, some sacrifices are specific to the type of animals, like the purification ritual before entry to the Jerusalem temple or taking part in holy activities after coming in contact with a dead body, one of the impurest forms. This ritual has not been performed for a few centuries for two reasons, the absence of the second temple and the rarity of the red heifer. What is the red heifer and what is its significance? According to Jewish law, the red heifer must be a female cow that is entirely red, including its hair, skin, hooves, and even its internal organs. It should have no blemishes or marks that would disqualify it from the ritual. The red heifer is slaughtered and burned whole outside the camp, and their ashes are stored cleanly, mixed with water in small parts for each use to create a purification solution. It is important to note that this ritual purification is symbolic and has no physical cleansing effect. The red heifer is exceedingly rare in nature, and finding a cow that meets all the requirements for this ritual is exceptionally uncommon. The red heifer ritual is highly symbolic, and its significance extends beyond the practical aspects of ritual purity. It is a mysterious and spiritually significant commandment that represents the idea of spiritual purification and the need for atonement. As plans to rebuild the temple progressed, various plans and concepts have been proposed, and the most promising so far is one involving Rabbi Chaim Richman. Rabbi Chaim Richman, who served as the international director of the Temple Institute from 1989 to 2020, was a prominent figure associated with efforts to prepare for the eventual rebuilding of the Third Temple in accordance with Jewish tradition. One of the aspects of this preparation necessary for the rabbi involves the study, identification, and selection of a suitable red heifer. The rabbi has been highly invested in bringing back the red heifer to Israel, as is written in Numbers 19, a red heifer without blemish, and the Temple Institute, under Rabbi Richmond's leadership, was actively engaged in researching and promoting the understanding of various temple-related rituals, including the red heifer ritual, and worked to educate the public about their significance within Jewish tradition. According to Jewish history, only nine red heifers have ever been slaughtered to purify the Jews between the time of the first and second temples, amounting to about a thousand years, giving them enough time to become extinct. With the seeming extinction of the red heifers, and in a bid to find a solution, red Angus cows were imported from Nebraska, United States, by a Jerusalem-based organization. The entire process involved several organizations and individuals, including Bona Israel, which comprises members from both Jewish and Christian backgrounds. After many failed attempts, they announced the birth of a red heifer calf in Israel, the first to be born in the country in 2,000 years. This announcement has brought great excitement among those who believe it is a crucial step towards realizing their goals. Rabbi Yitzchak Mamo from Uvna, Jerusalem, expressed plans to hold a ceremony for the slaughter of the imported red heifers during Passover 2024. Still, it is contingent upon the heifers remaining free from any blemishes. But we must also understand that all the descriptions are subject to interpretations. While some believe the discovery of the red heifer and the rebuilding of the third temple is literal, some believe it could be figurative. Although they believe that Jerusalem plays a crucial part in the return of Jesus, they find it hard to reconcile biblical Christian teaching that Jesus finished his work of atonement on the cross 2,000 years ago, poured out his spirit, and founded the universal church with the new temple and its priestly sacrifices and atonement for sin. Regardless of the various interpretations and the plans in motion in anticipation of rebuilding the temple, it is worth noting that the Muslims still control the Temple Mount, and actions are being taken to recover it. Israel's Judicial Council ruled that due to the situation's complexity, the decision was beyond the boundaries of the law and had more reasonable ways to reach a decision. Aside from that, 
The project may require foreign aid from the Jewish diaspora and other countries. Still, financial aid usually attracts political strings, which can be a source of tension between Israel and the possible donors. Even if it does work out, it has to be on a common ground agreed on by the leaders of all faiths in the country. The Jews and Christians are not deterred because they believe they fulfill prophecies. Let's take a look at these prophecies. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel receives a prophecy about 70 weeks. Some understand this prophecy as a timeline leading up to the end times. However, a commonly accepted understanding is that the 70 weeks are divided into three sections, seven weeks, 62 weeks, and a final week. The first period of seven weeks, 49 years, is believed to refer to the time it would take to rebuild Jerusalem after its destruction. The 62 weeks, 434 years, are understood as a period of relative peace and development. Some see this period as leading up to the arrival of Jesus Christ. The final week, seven years, is the crucial period associated with the end times. During this week, many significant events are anticipated, including the establishment of a covenant, the cessation of sacrifices and offerings, the arrival of a desolating abomination, and the pouring out of decreed desolation upon the desolator, the Antichrist. When this occurs, it would signal the start of a time of great suffering and punishment, which would last until the end of the 70 weeks. The predicted Antichrist in the prophecy in Revelations 13 might be the political leader who would covenant with the Jewish leaders to rebuild the Third Temple, fulfilling some of the prophecies. Doing this could become a world power, and religious and political leaders would willingly follow him. Many Christians believe that the Antichrist will lead the forces of evil in the final battle against Jesus Christ, also known as Armageddon. Armageddon is a term mentioned in the Bible, specifically in the book of Revelation. According to the Christian interpretation, Armageddon symbolically represents where a final battle between good and evil will occur at the end times. It is referred to as the battle of that great day of God Almighty in Revelation 16:14. Armageddon's exact location is interpreted as either a literal or symbolic place. The term Armageddon is derived from the Hebrew phrase Har Magadan, which is translated as the Hill of Megiddo. Megiddo refers to an ancient fortified city strategically positioned along the Via Maris, an important trade route in ancient times. Due to its historical significance as a site of conflicts, Megiddo became a powerful symbol representing the final battle in the context of Armageddon. The Bible contains many passages speaking the signs of the end times. Matthew 24 verses 6 to 8 in the Bible speaks of wars, rumors of wars, famines and earthquakes as signs of the end times. Again, in Revelation, the four horsemen of the apocalypse are described as a metaphor to represent various disasters, such as conquest, war, famine, and death. The book of Revelation gives a more detailed account of the Battle of Armageddon, a final epic war on earth. The armies of the Antichrist will come together against the armies of heaven led by Jesus Christ, which will lead to a definite and total defeat of the forces of the Antichrist. This will mark the ultimate victory of good over evil, putting an end to all evil and the reign of the Antichrist. After the battle, the kingdom of God becomes established on earth in a millennial reign of peace, where Christ reigns and rules on earth. This establishes Jesus Christ as the Messiah and King of the world, whose wishes no one can go against. After this, the final judgment will occur, and the good will be rewarded with eternal life, while the wicked will be punished. Armageddon incites fear in the hearts of men, and the concept surrounding it reminds us to live in faith and righteousness in preparation for the ultimate judgment by God. Even people who initially have no fear or are nonchalant about the concept are getting more anxious with news of wars breaking out, disease outbreaks, and false prophets. Now it is easier to convince people of the second coming of the Jesus, and it might happen very soon. Repentance is the widespread message now, and getting people ready for rapture. Are all these coincidental, or are prophecies rapidly being fulfilled? No one knows for sure, but all are urged to work on the path and way of righteousness. Thanks for watching this video to the end. Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. Also, like and subscribe to this channel for more updates. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share with your friends so we can keep making them. For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.